One, two, one, two. All good to go? Okay, I make it uh, six o'clock on the dot. So, uh, evening everyone, and welcome to uh, this meeting of the Governance and Audit Committee, Tuesday, 9th of April, 2024. I'm uh, Chris Pearson, councillor for Beer Church and chair of the meeting this evening. Uh, in the event of any emergency, and I'm informed that there are no practice of arms expected, then I would ask that you evacuate the town hall by going down the main staircase or the back staircase just at the uh, rear of the room here and then to the car park behind the town hall in St. Rumble Street. Just a reminder that the meeting is being held in the grand jury room in the town hall is being broadcast live over the internet where it can be watched via the council's YouTube channel um, and it will be record, recorded and available for viewing afterwards. Please would all speakers uh, use microphones and speak directly into them at all times. Members of the committee and the public may use electronic devices to access meeting papers um, but please uh, be reminded to use everything discreetly and keep anything that you're using on silent. There are toilets on every floor in the building uh, and an induction loop in this room should anyone require it. I'm not intending that we will go on till 8 o'clock so there will not be a short break this evening. Um, we will be finished before eight o'clock. Um, and I'll just now ask people around the table to introduce themselves, starting with the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, Richard Block, Chief Operating Officer. William Sachs, Councillor for Rural North Ward and um, uh, Opposition Spokesman on Resources. Councillor Paul Smith. St Anne's and St John's Ward and Deputy Chair. Councillor Sarah Naylor, Lexton and Braswick Ward. Dennis Willits, Lexton and Braswick Ward, substituting for Councillor Dundas. Chris Hartgrove, um, Service Director, Finance, Shared, uh, and also Deputy Section 151 Officer. Alison J, Highwoods Ward. Good evening, Chair. Mm -hmm. Councillor Dave Harris, Beer Church Ward. Matthew Evans, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. So we've heard, um, moving down to item two, that there is a substitution this evening. Councillor Willits is substituting for Councillor Dundas. Um, item three, urgent items. I'm not aware of any. No, nope. thank you. Uh, leads us on to item four. Does anyone have a declaration of interest for any item on this evening's agenda. Nope. Right. Um, minutes of item five minutes of the meetings held on the 16th of January and the 7th of February 2024. Um, I'll take the 16th of January first. Are there any queries about the veracity of those minutes? No, I'm not seeing any indication. So can we accept those as an accurate record? Agreed, thank you. And the 7th of February, likewise, any uh, matters of veracity? No. Can again, can I just ask members to uh, give their approval for those? Right, thank you. Okay, so that's those minutes taken care of. Um, item six is have your say, and we have one member of the public in attendance this evening. Good to see you. And uh, 
It's Melina, and I'm going to apologize now, Melina, if I mispronounce your last name. Um, Spantidaki. Was I close? <laughs> right. Please come forward and take a seat. Right. Um, so you have a, a microphone in front of you there. You push the little button that turns a, a, a light red. Um, when you speak, you'll be given up to three minutes. You don't have to take all three, but you'll be given up to three minutes to uh, make your point, ask your questions, um, make any comments that you want, and then you'll be given a further minute following any responses that you get. Is that clear? Okay, over to you. On the 13th of March, I attended uh, the cabinet meeting because I was advised from the democratic services that they are the team that would make a decision about uh, the bid about the Holy Trinity, which I presented to the, full the last full council meeting. Um, the portfolio holder answered to my have your say that my ideas are good and to keep communicating, but the bill needs a lot of work before it is put to bid. I responded that we can help with the restoration and was encouraged to keep communicating. I made contact with professionals of the multi trade trying to get quotes and wrote an email to the customer services that they are that they are, the, the professionals are allowed entry. I got no response to this email. I have made a rough calculation based on realistic estimates I've got a quote from the professional sent to me, uh, which you can have a look at. Um, and all professionals agreed uh, um, as uh, I have a breakdown, which is as follows. Provided that Colchester Borough Council has a repaired roof, walls, electrics, and plumbing, I will do the designing of the kitchen, the community kitchen, and the fitting with a team from a carpentry training center. Costs, a uh, kitchen designed fully equipped with four door uh, fridge and two stoves fitted, total cost 50,000. Two washing machines and two double drawers, 5,000. Um, uh, on the floor, infrared heaters from home base, a one gear guarantee, 5,000. Carpet squat from tapi carpets, 10,000. Iconostasis for the um, part of the um, uh, church, framework 30,000, basic furniture from Emmaus 5,000 to start with, dividers of church and rooms 3,000, wall tops and basic equipment 20,000, up the above is 128,000, and I was calculating based having in mind the 147,000 pounds that already the council has. I got an email a few days later from the head of economic growth that my um, bid is dismissed as advised by Councillor King. I must admit that the above email was very upsetting. I have it here, but I don't have time. It seems to me that Councillor King bypassed the cabinet and made the decision all by himself, dismissing my bid without giving to it a fair chance as he did not open the door to the church to the professionals for exact measurements. And what is this terrible condition, as they are saying in the email, that doesn't allow um, and needs uh, repairing uh, two millions because the St. Martin's Church where I attend is also with Roman tiles and had to be restored. Thank you. That's the three minutes, I'm afraid. Um, I, I I'm not uh, fully au fait with what the latest position is regarding Holy Trinity Church. Um, I've had a, a quick chat with the Chief Operating Officer prior to the meeting, um, and my understanding from that discussion is that we are not any further along at this point. I don't know whether there's anything you want to add, Richard, in terms of the detail of uh, no, the no. queries that have been made. I'd, I'd, I'd refer um, the, the speaker back to our last um, public um, press release regarding the, the situation in terms of Community 360 who have been working with thus far in terms of Holy Trinity Church on the 8th of March, which we can forward to you separately if, if that would help. Um, 
um, and we're not we're not further on in terms of that particular position and our relationship around Holy Trinity Church. But um, I do think it's important that we still keep keep talking and keep in touch um, as the situation develops. So I think that advice yes. still uh, still holds. Have you finished? Uh, the email uh, says here that you are only considering the bid with Community 360. Um, there has been a lot of discussion whether this should go along. I, I have been to the scrutiny meeting to say that this child is totally rotten. For me, the whole bid is a, a very dubious, and I am really surprised that the council is still going ahead with that uh, uh, as planned. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, comments and remarks. I'm sure that uh, they will be taken into consideration. Um, and I know that Councillor King, as leader of the council, um, is always open to comments, to advice. He's also a liberal advices. democrat, and democracy means power of the people and decisions by the majority. Thank you very much for your contribution this evening. Right, um, that moves us on to item seven, which is the uh, main agenda item this evening. Um, I'm just going to start the item by reminding everyone of the terms of reference of the committee in the first paragraph. So the first paragraph of our terms of reference suggests that uh, it's our responsibility as a committee to consider and approve the council's statement of accounts, the count and the council's financial accounts, comma, and to review the council's external auditor's annual audit letter. Now, we're all aware that there have been difficulties with getting audited accounts either on time or at all for a number of years now. I remember when I uh, last chaired the committee that I was signing off the audited statement in November, if I remember rightly, um, which was several months after it should have been. Um, so the situation that we have with 2021 and 21, 22 accounts is not something that's arisen overnight not something that uh, we haven't had to address and live with for quite some time. Um, and we, we are aware, those of us who've been on the committee for a while, that there have been some issues with the external auditor having staffing and being able to meet its contractual obligation to, uh, to undertake the audit of our accounts. That's not just a Colchester City Council issue though, that's a nationwide issue. I uh, attend um, frequently or whenever they're held a meeting of audit committee chairs in the region and the last one I attended I asked the question was it possible for a council to appoint an auditor from down the road, an accountancy firm from down the road, let's say, to undertake the audit to get the audit done. The response was a categorical no. There is a statutory provision for auditing of accounts. There are a limited number of firms who've had to jump through the necessary hoops to, uh, to, to be considered. Um, sufficiently skilled to undertake the audit of local authority uh, accounts and those are the only firms that uh, any local authority can employ to undertake that work. So that's a non-starter. I know we, we all um, would have hoped that our accounts would have been audited by now but um, for 22-23 but unfortunately they aren't. There is a, a plan afoot to do something, um, either fully audit or audit with a disclaimer by BDO, BDO um, of these accounts by the end of September this year. Uh, and 
until those accounts are audited, whilst there may be questions and queries about the draft accounts that have been put before, before us, we need to be mindful of the fact that these are unaudited accounts. So our questions and queries are about a, a set of unaudited accounts. Um, that said, I, I personally am absolutely certain that with the potential exception of a, a missed zero here or a missed one there, um, the information that's been put before this committee uh, by our Section 151 officer and our, sec our Deputy Section 151 officer are absolutely accurate. I think I'm, I'm even more um, uh, assured because we have been utilising the services of Andrew Small and Chris Hartgrove over the last 12 months now um, in a shared um, services arrangement with Epping Forest and therefore they have had no responsibility for the, um, the, the, the working of, those, of, of these accounts of 22-23 of, uh, um, and if they had found anything when they've been turning over the stones I'm sure they would have come to us by now and informed us of that. So I, I am assured, I am reassured um, from my conversations with our two senior uh, financial officers that there is nothing to be concerned about in these draft accounts. That said, I am aware that <coughs> there are queries and questions that have been raised about the draft accounts. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Chris in particular for the extraordinary amount of effort and work that he and the team have put into responding to uh, a significant number of written requests for information which Councillor Sunnox has, uh, uh, has, has quite um, spent a significant amount of time um, producing and asking for answers to. Um, and what I'm going to say before I bring um, Chris Hartgrove in is that this evening I am quite happy to allow Councillor Sunnox to ask for any clarification and, and update on his written questions and the responses that you've had, um, but I'm not prepared to spend ages and ages this evening going through a draft set of accounts. We've all had copies of um, Councillor Sunnock's queries and we, we all should have had copies of Mr Hartgrove's responses to those. So you've all had the opportunity to have a look at that. Um, Councillor Willits, I, I appreciate that because you're substituting this evening, you may not have seen those, but I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, I'm just going to uh, stop there and ask Mr Hartgrove just to come in and then I'll bring you in, Councillor Willits. Mr Hartgrove, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just thought it would be best to sort of um, say a few words to put, put this in context for the committee um, before, we, before we move on to the detail. But the, the draft statement of accounts presented before you this evening um, relate to 22-23. Um, um, they've been prepared um, to the best of our understanding in compliance with the um, SIPFA um, accounts and advisory committee's guidance on the accounting rules relating to the application of accounting standards specifically and I emphasize specifically relating to local authority accounting which is different from the, from the public sector in many respects. Um, appropriate technical advice has been sought and taken where appropriate in relation to matters of taxation, valuations, Treasury Management and Investment Recognition and Collection Fund Accounting. Um, the committee is invited to note that the draft accounts have been published prior to consideration by the Council's External Auditors BDO 
Um, the role of the auditors is to review the accounts, including the accounting entries and the notes to determine whether they present a true and fair view of the council's financial position at this date. Um, the role of the auditor is to report to those charged with governance, is the uh, technical phrase I believe, um, in the audit world, uh, and that is the uh, Governance and Audit Committee in, in, this, in this instance, and provide you a statement on the accuracy of the draft accounts prepared by officers. Um, the statement by the auditor will be presented to the committee alongside an amended set of financial accounts, should it be necessary, um, which the committee will be asked to consider whether it wishes to adopt. Um, once adopted as the final set of accounts by the Council and subject to the auditor being satisfied that any concerns have been raised have been corrected um, within the bounds of materiality, the auditor will sign the final accounts as a true and fair view. Um, importantly, the auditor is working to the elected members of, of this committee to provide you with the assurance over the accuracy of the accounts prepared by officers. In doing so, it recognises that local government accounting is extremely complex and therefore the auditors hold the requirement to provide um, professional and technical reassurance that the rules have been correctly applied. Um, any challenge to the draft accounts at this stage will only be followed by more, a more rigorous and thorough review of their accuracy by the auditors before a final set of accounts is presented to the committee after the audit process has been completed, allowing the committee to properly, properly and thoroughly consider them in detail with the appropriate professional reassurance provided by the auditor. Um, any detailed review at this stage adds little value as errors in accuracy, application of standards or assumptions contained therein will be identified and reported to the committee together with an amended set of accounts prior to the committee being asked to adopt them. Um, Recognising that this is only the first stage in a thorough process, the committee is only asked to note these accounts and, and on that basis I haven't got I chair the, the uh, technical accountant with me this evening so um, please bear with me on some of the detail and uh, I will have to uh, take it away potentially. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Willits. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Um, uh, I was just going to say that you were, uh, you were confining discussion to a set of uh, notes or questions, uh, a copy of which has not been supplied to me uh, as a, uh, a visiting member uh, substituting for Councillor Dundas. Now, I'm, I'm sure that list is, is sensible and satisfactory from the point of view of, of members, but I would just like it minuted that that list has not been supplied to me. And if therefore I'm not allowed to ask questions uh, because they appear on some other sheet that uh, I've not been supplied, then I would consider that a very unfair way uh, of, um, of operating uh, our scrutiny of the, uh, the the process this evening but that said you know i broadly subscribe to, um, uh, to to what the function is this evening um, remembering of course the supremacy of councillors uh, in all matters other than those which are specifically addressed uh, in the local audit and accountability act and so on where issues certain issues uh, are statutorily made the responsibility of the section 151 officer and therefore we must accept uh, his view and his presentation on these matters. Thank you Councillor Willits um, and I, I just remind you of the remarks that were made by our section 151 officer that um, these accounts will come back to the Governance and Audit Committee once they have been audited um, we're looking at a draft statement of accounts. Um, I'm just wondering, Mr. Evans, if you have the email trail that you could possibly forward on to Councillor Willett so that he can see those as we go through the remainder of this item. Yeah, so um, Mr. Evans is indicating that he can. So if you have access to your uh, council email, I'm sure that they will pop up shortly.
Unfortunately, I don't at this meeting. Oh, right. Okay. In that case, they'll be they'll be with you uh, when you're able to log in. But I, I have no doubt that uh, Councillor Sunnox will also be able to uh, to fill you in. Um, right. William, I think at this stage, I'm going to ask you if there's anything more, any, any points of clarity that you have around the responses that you've received from our Section 151 officers, um, or if there's any, any other point that you wish to make on the draft 22-23 accounts. Um, I, I've asked a load of questions and um, um, uh, Chris Hartgrove has been very generous in replying to them. But I have to say, uh, we're not seeing eye to eye. And I've still got serious concerns about the accounts. And I want to just say why I think it's important. Um, they are our only external control, as far as I can see, for the council. I've been reaching out for where else we have constraints. Do we have cash constraints? No, we don't. Do we have borrowing constraints? Not really. Do, it's those reserves, and it's in these audited accounts that tells us where the boundaries of behaviour that we can go to are. And we rely on our budgets and our monitoring reports, but these accounts have almost no uh, crossover into those reports. I can't reconcile the figures back, and, um, and I, I, I'm told it's a very hard job to do it. So this is it. This is our, our statutory accounts. These define our reserves. These tell us what our boundaries are. And I don't think we're paying enough attention to them. And I feel this is, we've had two years since I've been a councillor where we've been pushing it forward and the auditors have promised to perform next month and we've all blamed the auditors and so on and so forth. But I think we've now come to a point where we've really got to make a decision about whether we're going to take it seriously and really go for sorting these out and put it as a priority, or whether we're going to uh, go with a herd of other councils who are, uh, I don't know what they're doing, I don't know what their plan is, I don't know what our plan is really. Um, some talk of having an audit by the end of April and then accepting two years of disclaimed audit opinions. Well, there's a whole load of questions that come from that that I think we should discuss this evening. So. I don't want to drag the whole committee through a whole load of debits and credits in the accounts. You'll be pleased to hear that. Um, but I, I think I'd, I, I'd be very encouraged if I felt that members of this committee had engaged with the accounts and were really treating it seriously. And if there were some uh, um, questions that showed people had actually read and understood them, I'm really disappointed that we haven't got the technical accounting people here and we haven't got um, uh, the portfolio holder for resources here. You know, this is, this is major. We're looking at taking disclaimed audit uh, opinions. And in the land of accountancy, that's a triple black mark. It really is, you know, the only reason you get a disclaimed audit uh, um, uh, opinion is normally because we haven't provided the audit evidence that they require. So, um, you know, we need, to, we need to, as a committee, we need to take that apart. By the time we come back after the elections in the new municipal year, it'll be really too late to do anything about it. So I regard this meeting as a very, very important meeting. We need to take whatever time it takes to make a decision on whether we're going to <laughs> blame the auditors and hope for the best or, um, or go for a, a, and hear what a real plan for solving this problem is. Thank you, Councillor Sonnex. Um, I'm, I'm just going to bring Mr. Hartgrove back in because I, I was I was going to ask him also if he could just um, inform the rest of the committee what he informed us of when we had our briefing yesterday about um, <coughs> meetings with BDO and where we might be at going forward. But also, if you've got anything, Chris, that you want to say in response to uh, Councillor Sunnick's comments, then. And there's just, just one point of detail I want, I want to address before I go, go into to what I mentioned yesterday. Um, uh, you pick, uh, Councillor Sonnex picked up on the issue of a disclaimed um, audit opinion. Now, um, in this specific context, and I must emphasise it's in this specific context, at the moment the external auditors 
our awaiting guidance um, in terms of um, professional guidance that the actual audit that they conduct, albeit a uh, light touch audit, I think it's fair to say, to issue the disclaimer opinions. It will be, ri I'm, I'm advised by uh, BDO that it will be risk based and, and as I say, completely comply um, with the um, uh, auditing guidance that they're given. So they, they can simply can't just write off the accounts without um, any assurance whatsoever. So I just want to address that point first of all, that they're, they're not allowed to sort of get away with that. So there is some assurance, albeit limited, I will accept. Uh, and that is what will constitute a, um, a, a disclaimed opinion in this context. Um, with regards to the current status of the audit, um, I met with um, BDO about three weeks ago or so, something like that, informally, and uh, basically they expressed a commitment to um, get the 2021 accounts signed off um, as quickly as possible. The, the audit work is substantially complete and the partner returned to work just yesterday, has been on a career break, I, I won't bore you with the, the, long, the long story, but um, uh, in the um, audit world, the partner, the original partner that started the audit has, re in this instance, retained responsibility. They couldn't BDO uh, another partner if they came in to cover for the work done by the previous partner, would have to go right back to the beginning and start again within the auditing rules which is the reason for waiting, for BDO waited for the partner to return, okay? She returned to work yesterday, I believe, and that, that was the plan anyway. At that point, the audit review process, and that means the completed audit, the, the audit work is, is complete, substantially complete. The audit partner reviews the audit work, not the accounts, reviews the audit work completed, and then um, decides uh, and the next um, steps in terms of issuing the opinion. Now, um, in my experience uh, of other, uh, I can't speak for BDO, I'm new to BDO, but in my experience of other external orders, sometimes that can involve quite a number of queries, although they did say that they, they had ambitions, informally they said they had ambitions to sign off by the end of April. Now, I'll be perfectly honest, I. I didn't, you know, I was a slightly sceptical and thought that would be quite ambitious, but I, I will, um, I would say that they, they are reasonably committed to doing this quite soon. So I don't envisage an opinion by the end of April, but I would envisage uh, an opinion quite soon. And with regard to the 21, 22 and the 22, 23 accounts, they expressed their intention to proceed um, towards ga gathering the necessary assurance to issue a disclaimed opinion in both instances. And they've already started planning work on the 21, 22, and to a limited extent on 22, 23 as well. So that's all. Thank you. So that, <clears throat> that just brings us up to date in terms of anticipated audit. You, there's one more point you wanted to make. Go on. Apologies, Chair. One thing I forgot to mention, I have asked for this in writing. Uh, I have sent an email and they've yet to get back to me. So. Thank you. So when, when, when we have that um, information in writing, assuming that there's nothing that is confidential in that response um, regarding maybe the, uh, the, the period of time away, for instance, um, could you circulate that to members of the committee, please? Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, ask you, Chris, um, if um, when I think they, BDO came before the committee I think last August, um, was there any mention or indication at that point of planned career breaks by the audit partner? I don't remember specifically, but it has been long known about. But I, uh, I think I'll qualify that. I'll backtrack slightly if, if you'll bear with me on that point. I don't, I don't think that's 
the sole reason for the delay in the audit, to be fair, so that they have kept, uh, they have had another partner there to keep the audit warm, was the phrase used. So I, I think I probably didn't explain that very well, but uh, that is the circumstances in terms of signing off, in terms of the process. So, you know, it would be speculation on my part to suggest that that is necessarily the sole reason for the delay, but it, it doesn't help, I suppose, is all I can say. Only they can answer that one. Right, and I'll just remind the committee members that, you know, this isn't an issue that is only affecting Colchester City Council. Um, this is an issue that's effect, affecting a significant proportion of local authorities in England and Wales. Um, so it, I don't think that we can extrapolate from what Chris has just explained to us in terms of his discussions with BDO that the delay in auditing our 2021, 21, 22, and now 22, 23 accounts is down to a member of staff not being available. Um, I think there are a lot, you know, if you, if you take account of what's happening nationwide, there are lots of other issues going on. And uh, I say from, from my attendance at the um, audit committee chairs meeting, uh, it, it's exercising audit committees all around the east of England, certainly. Um, but nobody seems to have a definitive answer as to how to get us out of this other than what we've already heard and what we've seen. And going back to the consultation that was held with local authorities, what, two months ago now, where we're asked to make our comments about what happened going forward. Uh, we are where we are, unfortunately. Um, not of our own making or our own choosing. Um, Councillor Smith, I'm going to invite you in next, and then uh, Councillor King's indicated, so I'll bring him in. Thanks, Chair. I mean, I, I come back to, I think, the item on the agenda is the noting the 2022-2023 accounts. Uh, I certainly have been very vocal on the problems that many councils have had, but this is not the time to rehash those arguments. And I do take um, note uh, in response to Councillor Naylor's question that the reasons for the delay are certainly not entirely due to the career break of the auditor. There have been other re reasons in the background for the delays. But our question is whether we should note these accounts tonight or not. Now, I don't like the idea of what I would term a qualified audit that we're being offered for these years, but it's not our decision. The government, working with the local government association, has come to the conclusion that that is the way forward to deal with the huge backlog of audits that are built up for whatever reason. That being the case, I don't see there's any point in us trying to do our own thing because that would surely just add to the confusion the delay in the backlog um, you know this is not a private sector company where we can change auditors from one firm to another as part of our normal course of business these auditors have to be particularly qualified to do the work so we can't just say, right, we don't like audit to A, we'll have another set, thank you very much. Whereas if we were a limited company, there are dozens, perhaps hundreds of auditors that we could use. So I think what we're looking at is noting the accounts and I'm happy to note them on that basis. Thank you. Councillor King. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity just to say a couple of words. I, I wanted to pick up on Councillor Sunnock's uh, observations and perhaps a concern about the importance that the administration places on, on the accounts. And uh, I'd hope nothing that you have heard, actually, or the committee have heard, suggests we're anything other than very committed. The work that's done by the finance team that we've helped strengthen 
conscious decision um, is, I hope, an illustration of that and the service, William, that you've been getting. Um, it may not be perfect <laughs> or every answer, but it certainly is a demonstration of an intent to serve the committee as a whole um, in response to any member, and in particular in response to questions you've raised as the opposition uh, member in terms of resources. But I want to address the observation about uh, Councillor Corey. He's not here because he can't be. Um, I'm here in his place, so um, I hope you'll take me as a pale substitute on this one occasion. Uh, between us, we, uh, one of us or both of us do attend every governance meeting um, because of the respect we have for the issues that you are looking at, including the accounts. Two last points. I have the joy of, you had to hear this from me before, attending uh, Essex County Council's Governance and Audit and Essex Pension Fund's Governance and Audit equivalent. I can tell you um, their frustrations are yours. Um, their advantage uh, is that because they're Essex County Council, the sheer volume of business and their importance, as Councillor Dave Harris will know, they will, they will be in front of us, I suspect, in terms of the long queue of those who will get um, what limited resources are available um, from the auditors. So that's something for us to be bearing in mind. But we should, my last point, and again, William, is back to your own observations, we should secure all we can within the framework that uh, government and the industry um, are sorting. And there may be some flexibilities there. We should welcome any clarifications that we can secure. We should keep an eye chair on how this will appear to the public and as well as other members not, not here so in that sense, there may be something we can do. We do everything we can. I commit ourselves to securing that if we're able to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. Um, I, I, I think also we, we've, we've got um, a final item on the agenda this evening, the work programme for 23-24, which normally we wouldn't get involved in as the retiring committee because that would be for the new committee to set. But I would suggest when we come to that that we want to ensure that there is an item on that first meeting that just sets, uh, takes, takes uh, a test of the waters of where we, actually, we are actually at at that time because um, that will be I can't, I can't remember now, I forgot to look at the date of the uh, first meeting. It would be towards the end of May, beginning of, of June, I imagine. Um, and at that point, we should have known, we should, we should be in a, have had a clearer picture from BDO about what they've done with the 2021 accounts. And we should be uh, getting a, a, a better steer for where they're at with the following two years accounts, including the 22-23 accounts. I also just want to say, um, Councillor Sonnex, that uh, I, th I believe that this committee um, over the last two years has benefited um, significantly from your input and from Councillor Smithson's input. Um, I have to say on a personal basis that I was very sceptical about the establishment of Colchester Commercial Holdings when it first happened. Um, I asked and I've, I've occasionally asked questions at committee about what was happening with CCHL and didn't feel that I was getting the detailed responses that this committee um, required in order to be able to make appropriate decisions and that was both uh, under a, a, a Labour and Lib Dem administration and under a Conservative administration of the authority. But I think over the last, um, well, not the last two years, but certainly the first 12 months that you were on the committee, um, appropriate questions and comments were made about CCHL's activities, and that has resulted in appropriate action being taken over CCHL to ensure that um, it isn't an ongoing risk to the authority's finances. So I, 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 I welcome your contribution uh, in terms of ensuring that the uh, administration's feet are held to the fire from time to time when it comes to uh, ensuring its finances are accurate. That said, I come back to Councillor Smith's um, remark that here we have a set of draft accounts for note. When the auditors have um, done their work on them and brought 
their audit to this committee for full consideration, we will be able to say whether or not we accept the, uh, we believe that the uh, accounts as audited or as produced for us by the auditors um, are appropriate for us to uh, sign off or not. Um, I've seen one or two hands go up, so I'll take those in order. I've got Councillor Willits, then Councillor Sonnet. Uh, Chairman, I don't wish to query any of the, um, the accounting detail um, in, the, uh, in the accounts. One accepts that they've been done extremely professionally, extremely diligently, and, um, uh, and they, they are, they're good for the purpose they're there. But you know, be before giving my vote uh, to, to note the accounts, there are just one or two issues which um, I would um, appreciate a word of, sort of clarification uh, <clears throat> clarification on um, the, the, the first issue uh, as a uh, as a councillor we see management accounts and we now see the draft um, statutory accounts and when we look at the uh, the income and expenditure uh, item in the uh, in the draft accounts it bears no relationship to the uh, the management accounts, for instance, there on, on page 98, uh, we see a, uh, a gross expenditure by the council of 158 million, uh, 173 million after taking in technical uh, issues. Uh, but this doesn't seem to map anywhere onto the 118 million and the 85 million pound gross income, which we see in the management accounts. It just causes me confusion that we see sort of different ways of expressing our gross income um, in the various documents. Now, I, I would like to think that what we have before us today is the definitive version. Uh, it must be the definitive version. But uh, is it possible to explain in a few words why we don't see these numbers appearing in the management accounts, why we see completely different numbers? In fact, it perplexes me that we, when we look at subjective analysis and so on, we see figures which don't relate back to the, the draft accounts um, statement of, uh, of income and expenditure uh, at all. Um, I have a second uh, question. And although these accounts will now predate uh, the dormancy of the companies that you just referred to, <coughs> I've almost forgotten about those, um, at some stage in the future, we will need to consider the position of the accounts before and after dormancy. And um, those of us with long memories will remember the, uh, uh, the Enron problems when special purpose vehicles were set up uh, into which all the, uh, the debts were put uh, and the, uh, uh, the income was all shown in the main account. Now, I'm sure nothing like that is happening here, but we, d we are aware uh, that we've got dormant companies which have debts, possible repayments of loans, um, it, it, depending upon circumstances, whether the, uh, uh, the, the government department that gave us the loans will ever want them back. Is it possible from these set of accounts to clearly understand um, how we've moved into the situation of dormancy when we are seeing some of the expenditures of those companies placed in, a, in, um, in these other uh, companies which uh, we have no control over, we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know how the, uh, uh, the, the debts in those accounts will fare over the course of time. So I just wonder whether there is comparability between what we're expressing here and what we will have to express next year with the dormant accounts holding the, um, um, the, the expenditure which we may or may not have to pay back. Uh, can I stop after those two points, Jim? Thank you, Councillor Whips. I think that second query, um, and in some respects, I share your concern, but as a committee, we have seen the um, accounts from each of the uh, companies. So we've, we've got a fairly good idea of what's going on, although I know that there are some queries about potentially 
um, outstanding repayments should central government take a different tack to the one that we anticipate. Um, nevertheless, I think we've got a fairly good idea of going forward what that's likely to look like. Um, and I'd just remind you, and this is where I'm going to just say to Chris Hartgrove, I don't expect you to answer that question, that the item that we've got on the agenda this evening is purely the draft 22-23 accounts. The questions that you're asking, Councillor Willits, are certainly questions for the committee membership to be mindful of going forward when we are looking at the accounts as they come before this committee. Um, Chris, I'm not going to ask you if you can just answer the first point, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, it's a very good question why the accounts different to the management accounts. Uh, so the statutory accounts include a vast, and I emphasise the word vast number, of uh, technical accounting adjustments um, that are required for the statutory accounts. And the, the management accounts are, whilst they are, reconcilable are everything's reconcilable by the way so um, are vastly different um, vastly different because that is the you know the raw data if you like that's the performance against the budget so um, if you think about notional accounting adjustments that go through the accounts with regards to pensions um, depreciation which is reversed out which is an area of controversy sometimes, um, gains and losses on revaluations and a, a hundred and one other um, adjustments that go through and that's what makes um, local authority accounts um, so, so utterly complex and um, that's why we have technical accountants, very few who really understand all of this and I don't really account my uh, uh, in, include myself as a, as a technical expert at all by any means but um, um, I think the point about the reconciliation that was made by Councillor Sonnex is a good one um, and in terms of the um, the uh, net position the bit that affects your reserves um, that bit we, we will um, provide some assurance with the committee will provide a reconciliation on that piece I think that's fair comment um, with regards to the um, gross figures, that's a disclosure issue, um, not such a risk issue, but I do grant, I do accept the importance of it, um, and uh, we'll see uh, how we can weave that in as part of the um, continuing journey that we're going on in terms of transparency. But at the end of the day, the, the, the way in which the accounts unfolded this time, there was a gap between when the original act term was published in September uh, as opposed to when these accounts came here before you. So there will be some um, reconciling adjustments. Only, I'm not saying they're any different. Be, be, I'd like to reassure the committee that there's, you know, £163,000 surplus is £163,000 surplus, but that is, um, that will be, um, identified in the um, in the reconciliation so um, but I think the principle the principle is accepted but it is a huge piece of work and I've got the team at the moment producing the 23 24 accounts thank you um, and, and I just want to add to that that uh, I think I've I've cert I certainly take the view but I've heard comments from around the table as well that the way in which the quarterly outturn is presented to us is much more easily readable than we previously had um, and much more easily understandable. So I want to thank you and the team for that. Um, did you want to just come back quickly and then I'll bring Councillor Sonnex in. Sorry, just, just to come back on that single point because I think that, that's an extremely pertinent point. We've simplified the way in which the management accounts are presented to, to provide greater transparency. Um, established members of the committee will recall that previously there were a number of reconciling tables and um, explanations in there which, whilst technically correct, um, actually made it quite difficult, uh, me included, to actually follow 
um, and, and interpret those reports, the management accounts. So there is a balance. Uh, we're talking about highly complex and lengthy technical um, reconciliations here. So that's why the, there is uh, a question mark in my mind, where is the most appropriate forum for that in, in terms of presentation um, to help members in terms of transparency. I, I, I'd, I really wouldn't want to confuse people, but I'm in the uh, in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Councillor Sinek. Yes, I want to say that um, uh, some of the um, explanations and some of the tables are much, you know, are really great. And uh, when the teams stuck their heads around the problem, uh, they, they, they can produce some real clarity. And, and that's, you know, I'm really grateful for that. Now, the problem is that we serve two masters. We serve the funding basis and we serve the IFRS basis. And um, the, and the two are not meeting. It's the IFR, our, our IFRS basis that's being audited. So it's going from your fundamental uh, accounts into IFRS and then coming and then everything being reversed out to the reserves, which are what really matters. So it, it's, you know, it is difficult. It is difficult. I feel that the um, best way around it is to say, look, we've got to do this. Um, uh, we've got to do this IFRS stuff. So shouldn't we move our management reporting, our monitoring reports and our budget in that direction? It's really alarming to see that we've only been monitoring roughly half our turnover. There's another half of the turnover that, you, you know, that I, I can get it in dribs and drabs to get to 150 million. Most of the reports we're looking at for the general fund are showing turnovers of somewhere around 70 or 80 million. And then there's another, I don't know, 30, 30 or 40 million in the HRA coming through. And then, and then I'm beginning to struggle to how, how we get to the 150 million. So I think as a general point, this doesn't help us today, but as a general point, we should try and move our reporting towards the statutory reporting so that so we, we're trying to serve any one master and uh, taking in the uh, reserves rules as we go. Um, the point about whether it's worth spending the time at the moment doing the reconciliation, I, I really feel for you and your team. And I feel that the political support you get and the budget you get to get the job done needs to be an awful lot stronger. And this shouldn't be the technical accounting, shouldn't be a little thing on the side that you employ someone, you put them in the back room and hope they sort the problem out. It ought to be a mainstream problem. And I think that would help uh, help with the motivation and the focus to get us there with, as I say, the only external control we have. I could see, I'm going to shut up because I could see uh, Chris wanted to say something. Chris, over to you. Um, I mean, the bit about uh, reporting on a statutory basis rather than management accounts basis, I mean, it's an interesting concept. Um, you were talking about you know, a hugely difficult task and the output would be we, we get to where we are this evening where people can't understand the outputs that are presented. I think um, one of the things I would say, even if I do blow my own trumpet for one second, management accounts are um, easier for the, 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 cat, the um, committee to monitor the, um, uh, the position of the budget throughout the year, which is the primary purpose of them. Once again, I emphasise, I take on board the, 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 um, the, the added value, if you like, from, from a reconciliation in the appropriate place and in the right level of detail. Uh, and I'm not even sure we could do it anyway, even if we had vast resources to do it, it, it because of a lot of the information is supplied uh, at the year end. So, for example, we'd only ever, ever have annual pensions adjustments. We would only ever have annual fair value adjustments and so on and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I just, I'll bring you back in. Um, I, I, I think that your remark about, you know, the management accounts um, being readily accessible to most members of the authority, and I, 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 I make that comment advisedly, um, I'm, being, I'm going to be frank here, 
let's be honest, apart from those, who sit, those of us who sit around this committee table and the cabinet members and one or two other members of the council, every other member of the council, when you start talking about finances, the eyes glaze over and they really aren't interested and, and find it uh, a morass. So I think we need to be mindful of ensuring that what is produced is at least acceptable and is um, readable for every member of the council. And I, I take, I, I understand William, that you know you're you're a, a chartered accountant, um, but there are very few chartered accountants um, in the council. So I think it's it's essential that whatever financial information is provided to members is in a format that is easily understandable and readable by all of the members of the authority. Um, over to you, William. Yes. I agree. But what I'm saying is that we suddenly presented with an account showing an organisation with a turnover of 153 million, and we've only ever seen management reports on half that. And that's not good. That doesn't give you confidence that we're getting the management reports on everything. So somewhere in our management reports, we need to be, be showing or showing what the turnover, what we're responsible for. Private sector, turnover's got a a big legal meaning. It shows what your responsibility is. A lot of our turnover, I think, is just an in and an out. Um, so it's not it's not particularly difficult to account for. It should should, it should. But I just think it'd be nice if we could see in the management report a few figures that would reconcile through. And I take I, I agree entirely. You're not going to do your pension adjustments and your mark to markets and everything on in, in your management accounts. I wouldn't expect that. But if we've got something that at least gives the feeling that you're encapsulating the whole picture instead of half it, I think that would give everyone a lot more assurance. And in terms of doing the reconciliation, I mean, it's the most basic, it's the first audit test you do when you go into a company is, does the, is what they're telling the markets or the, the outside world the same as what is being talked about inside? So I, I, would, I would expect the auditors to require that to be done anyway. And I do feel for you with a lack of resource, and I would urge the administration to um, uh, support that. Um, the other point I wanted to come on to is the level of supineness, if that's a word, about the problem. I mean, we've heard today, um, we are where we are, we'll do everything we can, and we'll be testing the waters at the end of May. And I don't think where we are now, we've got a, uh, a, a new rule coming in that we've got to have done something by the 30th of September. So with under six months now, by the end of May, it's just going to be too late. I think we need to get the resolve into it and a different approach into it now. And Chair, if I may make a few suggestions of some of the things we could think about to try and get this right. He's looking a bit hesitant, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, uh, the first thing is, um, the, on, the, on, the, on the points of disagreement on the accounts, um, major repairs, I'd say, depreciation and post-balance sheet events, um, I suspect those would be points that uh, the auditors will raise, and I think it would be really useful to have a position paper on them, making it completely clear what we've done and why we think it's right. Um, when we've done that, I think it would be useful, if you want to get an audit, to, get a, 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 to do another set of draft accounts, tidied up with some of the input from the position papers, and trying to, um, and the reconciliation, of course, back to the monitoring reports. So you've got something that really feels as if it's a solid set of accounts. I, I, I would say, um, and I'm really not wanting to undermine the team, but I'd say that the accounts are at best untidy at the moment. The different pages don't agree to the to, to each other. Some of them don't add up. You know, um, nothing nothing fundamental, but just untidiness that needs deal, dealing with. Um, I think we another thing we could discuss is whether a carrot and stick approach can be taken to the auditors. 
and there we, we're trying to pay them, we, the, the accounts report that we're paying an audit fee of 39,000. Now given what the auditors have to do, these are complicated accounts, quite messy, and they're not only expected to give an opinion on it, they've got to, they've got to give a value for money opinion, and uh, they've got to look at the grants as well. Uh, the Audit Commission was charging about 200,000 a year for that, that would be 300,000 a year now not suggesting we spend 300,000, but I'm trying to make people see that if you're holding them to a very low audit fee, you've got to produce super clean accounts, and you can't really expect much of their time helping you um, uh, sort it out. And what's more, they won't be, <laughs> if, they can, if they can find an excuse not to do anything, if they can say we haven't answered all their questions or something, then they won't do anything. And I think that's sort of where we've got to, and I suspect other councils are doing the same, the, the same sort of thing. So there are some of the things we could do. The, also, we've got new auditors, I think, coming in for the 2023-24 accounts, haven't we? Well, there's an op I, I think it's KPMG, and I think the fee's about 150,000. Um, we ought to be talking to KPMG now about what disclaimed accounts means for their taking over of the audit. Are we going to, are we going to, um, have they got sound foundations? Are they going to have to qualify their accounts going forward? And I think that leads into a discussion about whether, <laughs> whether we get them to take over earlier, which will give some competitive attention for um, BDO. We need to give them the carrot of a proper audit fee and the stick of the threat that someone else will do the job and they'll, have to pay, they'll actually have to pay the fee for that. I imagine they're in breach of contract. I imagine we have a contract with them. And I feel that we need to apply both those, both those things and be the most proactive council to make sure that our audit gets done before other people. Because I really am worried and unhappy for all of us uh, around this table that we are where we are and we're using the sort of supine language we're using. And the last thing I want to say is that I really don't think we should go back onto the narrow remit of what the Governance and Audit Committee is meant to do. We, you know, we can look at the letters and say, oh, well, we can't do anything until the auditors report, and then our job is to sign it, sign it off. And, oh, our only thing we can do now is to note the accounts. I think we should have a, a very detailed minute of this meeting and of the points we've raised and we should have a proper discussion about them. We have to do it now. We can't kick the can down the road. We've got, got to decide whether we're really going to try, to try and solve this problem or, or, or whether, whether we're going to drift on from month to month, from promise to promise. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a rant, Chair. I'll be quiet. Thank you, Councillor Sonnex. Um, I, I, and I, I noticed um, Richard Block frantically scribbling one or two things down as you were uh, commenting there. So I'm sure he will take away one or two of the uh, suggestions that you're making. Um, I think at this stage, uh, what I would say to you is, if you have a motion that you want to put to the committee that would then be put to the administration, um, I'm happy to allow that to be tabled and voted upon. Um, but we need we need to know exactly in in what what the form of words for that motion would be. Otherwise, I think it's very difficult for to well, it's impossible to expect um, Mr. Evans or anyone else in Democratic Services to uh, take forward what you are suggesting. Um, Councillor King, whilst Mr. Sonnex, while Ca whilst Councillor Sonnex is uh, scribbling away, I'm just going to bring you back in on those comments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm looking forward, William, to how you're going to craft that. Um, uh, from my perspective, though, it shouldn't use the pejorative language of being supine. Right? That's not fair. On uh, and we're fair game. It's true. It's not fair on the administration's attitude, which is reflection in my view of what governance audit have seen which is to do all we can within the circumstances we have today 
I do not personally make a point of saying in any theatre it's all about the government. You know, we are where we are and we have to make the best of the circumstances we're in. We have to take responsibility for those. Conversation you and I have had very directly. Where we are able to make a difference, we must make a difference. But we are in a web of nation, nationally negotiated arrangements. And my, my, what I can glimpse of those beyond what's published, what I've heard in the County Council as one illustration, is very much that that has been the, re the reflection of a lot of, frank, let's be frank, argument, disagreement and disappointment, and the parties have come up with a way ahead in the three wide. Nobody's going to thank us for seeking to overturn it. If it were possible without an effect, I'd be very interested. But everything I hear suggests that where we are is, I'm afraid, where we are. We've got contractual arrangements that lock industry in with all their partners, blessed by, and bless us too, I have to say, for the results of it all, by government and the LGA. We're not going to be overturn that, overturning that. And I... And I would not see how we could justify, for example, you know, doubling the amount of money we give to a, a very disappointing auditor in, in terms of the service they provided us at this very late stage. So absolutely up for the principle that if there is a way in which, rather than sort of stop our attention from this committee or members in other respects to the issues we glimpse, you know, the need to improve transparency, then the issues of clarity which are being addressed up for that. There is no, uh, I want to look at Richard Block here and Chris. From my perspective, there is, we have resource mentioned several times, there is no withhold on resource. If the team need extra resource to do the job of quality that we would expect that the auditors will require, and you, when you receive the opinion, will see how that's all taken. We're absolutely up for that. We are not holding back. We want this job to be done as well as possible. And I personally, I was in Councillor Corey's role for a couple of years. It used to drive me crazy how opaque it was. I did my own small piece. I was not a William Sonnex, but I had worked with language, not numbers, with him to try and get the place into a better shape. It's much better than it was two years ago. So we're going to have to work with what we've got is my recommendation to the committee. And we're going to have to accept what we cannot do, cannot turn over the contract arrangements, we cannot do different than government has locked us in place to do. Anything else, Chair, I'm, of course, very happy to look at. Thank you, Councillor King. Um, I, I, Councillor Sonnex passed me uh, something as a suggestion for a motion. I've uh, passed back to him with a, f a few of my own comments. Um, I think, William, if there is a semblance of a motion there that you want to put before the committee, then I would ask you to do so now, and we'll then uh, vote on your motion. I, I, I think, you know, as I've said already this evening, you've, you've made some cogent points um, and some matters that, as a committee, we need to be mightily aware of not only now looking at these but going forward. Um, I don't see that there is any dissent from committee members around the table that there is a, a need to continue to um, assiduously look at the accounts and also to ensure that the auditors do do the job that uh, they're contracted to do. However, as Councillor King has just said, you know, we, the central government has entered into the arrangements that we are then a party to. Um, central government has taken its time deciding what to do about outstanding um, accounts. And I know I was on a meeting of um, audit committee chairs, a national meeting, sure, must have been July, August time last year, where we were told that something was going to be sorted uh, within a month or two. We finally got a consultation exercise at the beginning of this year. Uh, and I know uh, you're, you're, you've 
already highlighted that I've used the phrase already this evening more than once, I think. We are where we are. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the power to control where we are because um, the, the contracts with the limited number of auditing firms are, are nationally determined. Um, I say, I, I, I deliberately asked that question at the last, the last meeting of audit chairs and there were one or two others who went, oh yeah, why, why can't we? Because they were obviously thinking similarly and it was made very clear that there is a statutory framework for um, audit of local authority accounts that we cannot go outside. Um, and that went down even to parish council audit chairs who were in that meeting who, uh, who said, you know, I'd like to be able to go to the little local firm that's in the centre of the village and do it if we can't get them done. Um, but the answer was no, we can't. Um, so, William, have you managed to uh, come up with a, a form of words that you want to put to the committee? Um, I have. Well, I've got some suggestions. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get it all procedurally wrong, which doesn't mean that what I'm saying is wrong. Um, this business of not, us not having any power to do anything about it, I feel we need to come out kicking and screaming on that. And that, as I've understood it, the PSAA, and I have tried to look at their website, they are the procurement body, and we contract with them to procure audit services on our behalf. I can't see anything in their website or their, um, or their response to a, 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 the recent DLUC um, consultation that suggests they take, um, uh, they take responsibility for negotiating the fees and the extras and all the things that you have to, that relationship seems to lie with us. So I feel we should be using the powers at our disposal and giving a carrot to a donkey that's not done much is, is, is it that doesn't go down well, but it does work sometimes. If you want to get it into that trailer, it might work and, and a bit of stick too. So we ought to be kicking and screaming to try and uh, 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 get it there. And that's what I want to hear most from this meeting. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need some help on how to put that into a motion. I have, I have written down here some action points that um, uh, we might take, which are broadly what I talked about before, and also some questions that I'm hoping we can uh, get answered now about what a disclaimer means. Okay. What would a dis if we end up with two years of disclaimed audit reports, which looks as if it might be the direction we're going, perhaps we could hear from Chris or someone actually what it means. Will we still have an inspection period, for example? Uh, will we try to try and narrow the scope of that disclaimer? And Chris has already told us they won't be able to just say, we don't know. They've got to say, we agree with this, but we disagree with that. You know, how will we go about negotiating that down to the narrowest area? We know the infrastructure is a problem, for example. Will we be able to get everything else um, 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 uh, approved with just a narrow disclaimer? So we should be planning for that. Um, we have to do an annual governance statement, and I don't know how often we have to do it, but can we actually, can we actually do one as we sit here? To me, the accounts are the cornerstone of the governance. And I don't know whether we can actually do an annual governance statement as we sit at the moment. And, the, and lastly, you know, the rarity and severity of an um, audit disclaimer. I've just never come across it before. I don't know whether anyone's come across it in the public sector, but it's, you have. You know, what does it mean? What does it mean? On, on, P, on it PFI mean? accounts, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A complete disclaimer, and not followed by disaster. I, I think it's a, a, a really serious thing that we ought to be, we ought to understand. I very much like to hear what other people know and understand, as to uh, uh, particularly Chris, as to how we'd cope with that whole scenario. Right. I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer all of your questions, but uh, I'll I'll do my best for for, for uh, the, the, the bits around the um, disclaimers and, and the KPMG bit in actual fact. So um, the 
KPMG, by the way, are, uh, as you as you are aware, uh, are the auditors, the new the new auditors for the council, with effect from 23-24. We are actually already working um, with KPMG. They're in the they're in the proceed uh, in the process of planning um, their audit for 23-24. I've been dealing with them today. In fact, providing. Um, quite a range of various audit evidence, so it's a it's a big job, a new auditor. So I think that's relevant to the point that you made earlier on. You know, they they have to come in, get to know the council, establish independence from um, councillors, officers, and so on and so forth. It's a huge task for for a local authority, even uh, even Colchester City Council. Never mind a, a big London borough or anything like that. So. It is a, a very big task. That progress is in place now. Um, in terms of what do disclaimed opinions mean for their audit, um, that's what they're looking at at the moment. Um, one of the things that they're still looking for um, guidance around how, um, I can't remember, assurance or faith in the system will be restored in the following years following the disclaimers. So. It's going to work roughly along the lines of they will be um, looking at um, a selected group of balances and items in the years as we in the following two or three years after the disclaimed opinions, so they gradually um, restore full assurance. So things like um, pensions adjustments, for example, uh, a fairly low risk in the sense that a they're uh, Accounting adjustments anyway, and B, they're picked up by triennial revaluations. So it has a has a sort of degree of self-correction, and things like cash balances and that are obviously far more high risk. And there'll be a set of audit procedures to to actually establish those. So that's the way they intend to proceed. Uh, and that's obviously sorry to to repeat the point. It's a it's a national problem, and there are national there will be national guidance and frameworks that come out to, to guide them in that task. Don't know exactly what that looks like, but that's that's an audit point at the moment. Um, you raised the point with regard to inspection periods. Now we're currently talking to the auditors at the moment and their interpretation of the backstop. It looks likely that there will be an inspection period for all of our published accounts um, prior to the uh, the September 30th backstop, so there will be an inspection period. Yes, so so that that is looking ever well. It it will. That's sorry. 2021 has already happened, so we're talking 21, 22, and 22, 23, and 23, 24. So all three of those financial years will be uh, open to inspection before the backstop date of September 30th. So something will be coming down the pipeline shortly on that. With regards to narrowing the scope on the um, disclaimer opinions, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and I doubt the auditors will be able to answer that either uh, as of this evening. But again, it is something that's being explored by uh, a bigger beast in the jungle, if you like, than, than me. So uh, I don't. I couldn't give an answer to that. Thank you, Chris, for that uh, detailed response. Um, <coughs> have you got a motion? Right. Yes. Councillor Sonnex. A lot of my points disappear with that, so thank you, Chris. Uh, what I'd like to propose is that we do note um, uh, the accounts, um, but that we recommend to the administration, someone will help me if I get this all procedurally wrong, we recommend to the administration uh, that, that uh, we uh, have our position papers on the key points of disagreement, which are major repairs, depreciation and post balance sheet events, and a tidier set of draft accounts reconciled to back to the monitoring uh, reports. And that we do one other thing, and that is um, uh, investigate and plan for the consequences of a disclaimer of disclaimed accounts. So we've begun to get ahead of the game on what that might mean and start talking to KPMG and uh, BDO about what the disclaimer might look like and try and get, get a plan for it. 
and then you can say to them, well, look, you're going to have to disclaim in this area because you're never going to get there by the 30th of September, but we should be able to tick off this one, this one, and this one and give ourselves some assurance. So just a practical way. I do think, I will say, state publicly, that I think accepting a disclaimer is better than the present situation of just rolling it forward and not knowing where we are. Because at least then it will out what their worries really are. They won't dare, um, uh, you know, fluff over it because they know they themselves would be inspected. Okay, I think uh, we're probably going to need you to uh, just remind us of the wording of the actual motion because you went into. But I, so just just very quickly, William, just the actual wording of your motion, please. Nothing else. Okay. Um, that the committee note the 2022-23 accounts um, subject to a recommendation to Cabinet on three points. One, that position, pa position papers on the key points of disagreement are prepared, uh, major repairs, depreciation and post-balance sheet offence. We might want to tone down disagreement to, to um, our key points of concern, um, I think would be politer, wouldn't it? Uh, number two, a tidier set of draft accounts reconciled back to the monitoring report. And three, an investigation and plan for the consequences of accepting audit disclaimers before the 30th of September. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Smith. Um, I've certainly got concerns about point two, um, talking about tidier accounts or what have you. That sounds extremely disrespectful to our officers for what we're doing here. And I don't think that has anything to do with noting of the accounts. Position papers on points of disagreement, I think, are fine. Um, I also think we need to look at point three, we don't know what disclaimers there are going to be. So to go into a hypothetical position about, well, if, this if it's this disclaimer, then the results might be this. Prepare for the potential impact of the disclaimers might perhaps be a better way of wording it. Because that certainly is something that we could and should look at. So I think with those modifications to point three and I think the removal of point two it's something which I could live with. Thank you Councillor Smith. I, I, I share um, your comments about the wording and, and certainly point two I was very unhappy with but I think the, the point about disclaimer is as we've already heard from um, Chris Hartgrove we have no idea what that, that is actually going to mean um, certainly from the meetings I've attended where disclaimer has been discussed, nobody seems to be clear about exactly what that means. So I think the point about preparing or, or anticipating disclaimed accounts is probably germane. Um, and I could accept, William, the motion on the basis that Councillor Smith and I have just suggested. Councillor Naylor. Um, yeah, I just wanted to observe, and, and I have some concern um, arising from the debate around what the motion might be and some points that were made earlier by Chris, good points, around the, um, uh, the demands around transferring to a new um, auditor. Um, and I think earlier in the meeting you'd also referred to the fact that um, members of this committee quite rightly have asked numbers of questions, which we've already agreed help us to do our work. Um, and there's clearly some pressure being felt there in terms of time. So I wonder if the motion might also include ensuring that um, the team have adequate resources to uh, meet the expectations that are inherent in this motion. Councillor Willits, did I see you indicate? Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, I, I share the concern of, of members uh, about the vagueness of uh, 
uh, of understanding the, uh, uh, the disclaimers. We, we're not here, surely, asking for a philosophical argument into the effect of disclaimers in accountancy systems. We're looking, I would have thought, at a very specific issue, and that is whether uh, the inclusion of uh, uh, these accounts that we're talking about with a, um, a disclaimer uh, will in some way impede the new auditor, KPMG, from carrying out audits. I mean, it's, at the moment, the audit procedure is, uh, or the audit progress, um, is, uh, is in chaos for the reasons that we've rehearsed all the way through. And what we don't want to do is note another set of accounts which turn out not to be acceptable as a basis by KPMG because of the, the disclaimer issues. So in this motion, I, I think if it's possible to narrow the, disc the understanding of disclaimers down to enabling these accounts to be used as the input to KPMG, then I, I think it would, it would add clarity to the focus of what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Councillor Smith. Um, I think um, the answer to Councillor Nader's point about resources, we've had the commitment from the leader of the council already about the level of resources that would be sufficient to do them. So I don't feel that it's appropriate for us to <laughs> put a recommendation in when we've already been given that assurance by the leader of the council, unless we had reasons to doubt that the leader of the council was not going to honour that commitment. Councillor Nave. I think in the um, context of the discussion here, I think it is important to note because we've noted the pressures that um, the Deputy Section 151 officer has shared with us on a number of occasions, which suggests that, that there isn't perhaps the level of resource that, or perhaps a difference of understanding about the level of resource needed to meet that. So I do think it's an important point because I'm reflecting on the position of the Deputy Section 151 officer and the points he's well made tonight and in previous meetings. Thank Perhaps you. we should ask the I think, one five uh, one uh, to clarify. Yeah, I, I, I think we're in danger of drifting into territory that is not the responsibility of this committee. Ultimately, the council sets a budget, the administration um, determines how that budget is expended. I, I think um, I would suggest that Mr Evans, in terms of minuting the meeting, will note the comments that have been made about resourcing of the finance department, and that's probably sufficient for us to have made the point as a committee. Um, I think the, the, the more important thing for us to deal with this evening is our ongoing concerns about lack of audited accounts and the impact that that has going forward. And I think if I come back to Councillor Sunnock's original wording of motion, taking into account the comments that Councillor Smith and I have made, I think we can probably come up with something that we could all live with that also sets the tone um, and gives a framework for the administration and for the officers going forward as we move into this very uncertain period around disclaimed audits um, in the next few months. Councillor Sunnocks, do you feel as though you've now got wording of a motion that you could put before the whole committee? Sorry, uh, did Chair, you want to make before, a comment, before, Richard? Before you come yeah. in, I think it would be useful just for, for the Deputy Section 151 officer to come in regarding um, the revised um, motion in terms, I think, particularly the position papers. Yeah, okay. Um, just probably a couple, I, I realise that the, the, the second point is probably being withdrawn. I think, um, I think to a small degree, I think that that's fair comment, if, if a little unfair, might I say, on the, on, the, on the team that has had to prepare these accounts who were not with the council when these transactions took place. So, um, you know, I wouldn't like to, to feed that back to the staff. I don't think that's fair in any way. I, th I think I need to say that. Um, 
that said, I, I think the, the, the point about narrowing the disclaimer is an interesting one. I'm not sure that it would, we would get much success, but I do, I do think it's an interesting proposition, so I, I take that one on board. I think the other bit around, um, well, first of all, re, re preparing the accounts again or revising the accounts in some way, and also the uh, position paper, the reconciliation, it, it is all part of the audit process. So it would be, I have to point out, it would be a duplication of process. And I'd also point out, uh, and it's sort of been raised um, indirectly in this discussion here, the primary focus at the finance team at the moment is preparing the 23-24 financial statements and any other work yeah, at the moment, that involves um, across the two councils. I was talking to the, the Section 151 officer the other day. We realised that we've got seven live um, sets of accounts and four different external auditors that we're dealing with. Typically, we in a normal year, we'd be only be dealing with one of each. So I'll give you some idea of the, the scale of what, what we're dealing with at the moment. So any other duplicated work that we have to produce then I'd have to do, I'd divert the team um, from preparing the statements to, to actually deliver that so um, that's entirely uh, your choice of course. Uh, can, can I, thank you Chris. Can I just add Richard, um, through, through the chair that um, I think what I've heard is that Chris is suggesting um, any additional resources um, would actually be dealing with duplicated work so work that would have been done anyway later on in the process. So I just think that's really important for, for members to keep that in their minds. Councillor Smith. I'm sure Councillor Sonnets wouldn't want to see work duplicated unnecessarily. And if it is going to already be happening, then that will be fine. Uh, if it is not done to Councillor Sonnets' satisfaction, <laughs> I'm sure he will be back at an appropriate opportunity. I think the messages, Chair, are, are, are clear and that we should drop the um, uh, further draft of the accounts because, as you say, you're going to have to do it anyway uh, as part of the audit process. And I guess, I'm going to guess you're going to have to reconcile back to the monitoring reports as part of the audit process. I'd be surprised if you didn't, if, 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 if that wasn't required. So happy to take just the um, uh, position papers and the investigation of the consequences of, this, of disclaimer as the, two, as the two points, and to make the wording milder if you want to. But what I want you to know underneath, in your own soul, is that you need to get in there and get ahead of the game on the kicking and screaming uh, as to how we can get the best possible assurance out, out, out of it. And, and I do think it's really important planning for it because if you've decided, if you've got an idea of where the disclaimers are going, you can plan the audit work more efficiently. So it doesn't have to go in, all those words don't have to go into the motion, but we really do need to um, uh, gird it on the front foot. Thank you, William. I'm, I'm going to suggest now then, given the um, discussion that we just had, I won't call it a debate, but the discussion that we've just had around the table um, and the fact that we've actually narrowed down the focus of what um, the administration and the finance team will, are expected to be looking at going forward, that we don't need a motion, but in fact that that's picked up in the minutes anyway. Um, that I noticed that Richard Block was was jotting down some of the remarks that you were making also. So I'm sure that Richard is the senior officer responsible for over, uh, overarching responsibility. Um, we'll take those away and be mindful of those. Um, the leader of the council is here this evening as well. We'll take account of that. Um, unless you feel the need now to put a motion, I'm suggesting, William, that We've had a fair discussion and debate about concerns around audited finances, about the veracity of the numbers in front of us, uh, and there's sufficient there to be taken away without a motion. 
Are you comfortable with that or do you still want to put your motion? <laughs> I think a motion would be better because it puts the, uh, 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 I'll defer to other opinions, right. but I think it puts, case, the, it puts the administration, uh, okay. the administration on the spot Fine. and that's where the responsibility Fine. should In be. that case then I'm going to ask you just to uh, read your motion as it is now and then I'm not going to take any further discussion and debate but we'll, uh, we'll vote on that motion. Could, could Councillor Smith reread what he wrote? <laughs> you want Councillor Smith to put your motion In that case, if he you. hasn't written anything, I'll, I'll try and do it. But I, I'm trying to say the same as him. Okay. Uh, the committee noted the accounts subject to uh, a, um, recommending to Cabinet that position papers be prepared on key points of disagreement, major repairs, depreciation, and post-balance sheet events. And uh, that there is also um, uh, uh, that also uh, 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 that the cabinet investigate and plan for the consequences of disclaimed accounts. Okay, I think there's still some concern about the wording of that second part of the motion around um, the the disagreements. I was going to suggest that perhaps we note subject to our concerns about the three specified areas. We don't ask the specific, a position paper, which would be duplication, but we note our concerns about those issues. And again, we ask for the preparations about what we can do to minimise any qualifications to the accounts and prepare for them. I like your wording on that bit. Okay. Um. <laughs> well, we, need, sorry, we, we do need position papers. Um, it's the second one that, I, that I'm happy to turn down, so long as we're looking at the disclaimers ahead of the game. Okay. Did you want to come in? Well, yeah, just I, I wondered if we could take the motion separately because I don't agree that everybody agrees there's disagreement on those and that we need position papers. We're following accounting codes and practices, I think we should understand that those have been done correctly. We're looking at drafts accounts that are going to an auditor for the very purpose. I do agree um, that perhaps the second point I would be happy to accept, but certainly not the first. Thank you, Councillor Jay. And I think that was what we were trying to tidy up, wasn't it? Um, it's just, so what, what wording have you managed to come up with jointly now? For yeah. Well, my wording is that uh, we are that we ask the uh, uh, that position papers be prepared on the key points of disagreement, major repairs, depreciation, and post balance sheet events, and I don't think that's wasted time because I think the auditors want to see that anyway, and I think we would want to see it. We want to know exactly what if we focus on those three things, what the rules are, and what we've done. Councillor Smith. Uh, I think we should take that part of the motion separately and have a separate vote on that one. Okay, so in, in other words, Councillor Smith is suggesting that you won't want to break your motion down into two parts because I'm getting the feeling that there may be um, a, a, a few members around the table who might not be comfortable with the first part but will certainly um, support you on the second part of the motion. Are you happy to do that? Right, so let's take the second part of the motion first, because I think that may well be uh, easy, the easy one to accept. So if you want to just move that second part, please, Councillor Senate. I move that we ask the Cabinet to investigate and plan for the consequences of disclaimed accounts. Thank you. Nice and easy, simple, straightforward. It makes sense to me. Um, those in favour, please show. That's unanimous. I was, I was anticipating that that might well be. This second motion, I think, may not be. I propose that the Cabinet be asked to prepare position papers on the key points of disagreement on the accounts, major repairs, depreciation and post-balance sheet events. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Those in favour? That's one, two, three. Those against? One, two, three. That leaves it down to me. And I'm going to vote against, I'm afraid. Right. I think we've uh, dealt with the item on the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. Do we need to formally note the item on the agenda? Yeah, we do. I was just going to come to that before I moved us on. So I apologise for my keenness. We need to formally note the draft 22-23 accounts. So noted. You're voting against. That's fine. Yeah. So call for name vote if there's a second member supporting me. I support. I, I don't. I don't think a, a, a committee, yeah, procedurally, I don't think a committee can do that. And also... Uh, chairman, uh, can we have the we'll, Constitution we'll, read to us on yeah, this matter, please? We'll, we'll double-check yeah. constitutionally. All matters that apply to council also apply to committees. Well, my recollection of the Constitution is that it would take four members of the council to seek a named vote. <laughs> two. It's two. It's two. You're right. Yeah. Let's not make it up as we go along. Yeah, no, Let's two. read from the Constitution. You're right. yeah, it's two. Okay. Um, are you checking, Richard? Right. Three. Thank you. Okay, so um, I've just been informed it's three members. Um, the four, I now recall, the four was my union uh, rule. Um, so, three members have to request a named vote. Do I have three members to request a named vote? I, I do. Okay, fine. So, we'll have a named vote, and I'll ask Mr. Evans just to uh, go around the room and ask each one of us how we vote. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Chair. And this is in relation... Before we do that, can I just make it clear that this shouldn't upset the um, resolutions that we've already passed? Now, this is purely on whether or not we note the 22-23 draft accounts. OK. Roman Councillor Sussex. Do, do you agree to note the, the draft accounts? Be loyal to my co uh, uh, party colleagues and agree not to note the accounts. Councillor Smith. Councillor Naylor. Not to note. Councillor Willits. Not to note. Councillor Jay. Agree to note. Councillor Harris. Agree to note. Councillor Pearson. Agree to note. Then the accounts are noted at four to three. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Right. Well, that, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever, ever come across that in all my time as a councillor, the committee doing that. But anyway, here we go. Moving swiftly on then, last item on the agenda, work programme. Um, we've dealt with the work programme for 23-24. Um, I think, as I said at the very start of the, or, or very early on in the meeting this evening, uh, we probably want to ensure that the committee in the new municipal year takes account of uh, everything that we've been discussing this evening and that it's certainly an item on the agenda for its first meeting, which I have now had a look at, is on the 18th of June. Right. And all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for everyone's contribution this evening um, and in particular for Chris for his uh, steering us um, very astutely tonight but also to the finance team for uh, 
producing all the information that they do for us for responding to uh, detailed queries in the way that they do um, and to our section 151 officer as well for uh, for what they've done and finally to uh, Matt for keeping us on track throughout the year yeah. and uh, that's the end of the uh, the GNA for this municipal year thank you one and all Good night. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.